in 25 minutes the memorable confrontation from 1960 when Adam Faith came face to face with John Freeman. First, from October 1971, Max Robertson presents Going for a Song. Hello, welcome again to Going for a Song, and once again we've got for you not only interesting things, but interesting people, and first of all we meet a man who says he makes a point of not collecting antiques because he lives in a glass house, trumpeter extraordinary Humphrey Littleton. Hello. And uh, taking him on, on the other side, is somebody who's interested in Victoriana, Joyce Blair. Good afternoon. And we welcome back on the specialist side here, a man who knows about all sorts of extraordinary things, Roger Warner. Hello. And if he should fail, well, there's Arthur, who has such a wide range of knowledge as well. Arthur Hel Ligas. Hello. So, let's have our first object, please. And now for viewers at home only, this flintlock pistol mounted with a silver crown is a tipstaff. Tipstaffs were used as a symbol of authority to make an arrest. The maker's mark on the silver is that of R and S. Hennel, whose name also appears on the pistol. The silver has the London hallmark for 1814. Humphrey Littleton's first honour here. My goodness me. This is the most extraordinary looking thing <laughs> that I think I've ever seen. It's surmounted by this crown, a silver crown here. Uh, this bit unscrews and out comes a sort of rudimentary screwdriver or a... No, I've, I'm absolutely baffled by this. It looks to me as though uh, it's uh, going to be on the lethal side. In fact, there's a little fellow here, a little bit there that, that comes out. No, I thought one moment that it might be a trigger, but I'm pulling it and it hasn't gone off, so... I'm glad uh, you were pointing it skyward. <laughs> <laughs> I'm absolutely baffled by this. I should say that it was date-wise, I should put it, I suppose, at uh, about, or oh, 1800. Beyond that, I'm going to, oh, there's, yes, yes, 1800. And so Joyce nice. will now tell us what it is. Yes, are oh, you baffled oh, too? <clears throat> Well, uh, I don't know whether any of... Oh, there's a, a mark here. It is very beautiful silver. I don't know, is that sort of chased? Or what? This lovely crown on the top. It's sort of loose-ish. It's... Is it just something to do with the weather? <laughs> I don't know, that does come out, or does it... I don't know, is it a sort of a pretty bottle, that... Would it stand... No, it doesn't stand up. I think it goes like that. No, it doesn't. <laughs> I don't really know what it does. Oh, I've it dropped does it. That. Oh well, never mind. I'll pick that up for you. Will you? Yeah. So I don't really know what it is, but I think it is earlier. I think it's about um, oh um, late sixteenth century. Late sixteenth or eighteenth? Mm. That puzzle. Yes. It looks a bit like the original Commons bauble. Um, what do you think, Roger Warner? There's this bit that's come out. Well, I'm very puzzled indeed. I've never seen anything like this before. Holding it like that, it looks like a tip staff or small mace. What's a tip staff? Uh, what, uh, a sign uh, of authority so that the representative of the sheriff could come, hammer at your door, uh, say, open up in the name of the sovereign. And frequently at the end, you had in the summons to the law court. Here, it looks to me as if, having knocked at the door, if there was any trouble, you pointed it round and that you have got a pistol. Here is a piece of flint which seems to be striking down. Uh, and there's a name of Hennel and Co, who were famous gunsmiths in the second half of the 18th century. Uh, I've never seen one before, extraordinarily rare, and I would think that you arrived uh, to arrest the criminal. Uh, if there's any sign of trouble, you quickly 
pulled it round and uh, shot him when he tried to escape. So you're going for a tipstaff? I'm going for a tipstaff, but you've completely stumped me on this one. Arthur, have you well, seen that? No, I've never seen anything like this. I'm just going to see if it does fire. Why not take the thing out in case it's got a bullet in? Stand on one side. <laughs> yes, it's quite right. Well, that must be right what he said. It's a flintlock pistol made by Hennel. Um, I'm, yes, there's, oh, it's got, it's silver mounted, of course, uh, as he has said. The date is a capital T, M-N-O-P-Q-R-S-T, 6 on to 1808, makes it 1814. Quite right. Now, those are the dates. Well, was uh, Hennel still going then? Uh, well, I thought he was earlier, but he might, I think he must have been. He certainly looked. He must have been because, because we've got the address this side, mm. Foster Lane, London. I was wondering they, whether that was an adaptation, whether it had been mounted onto it. But well, do you think it, it, it might well have been? Of course, who can tell that? Unless you've got. I can't see the. Um, I can't see the uh, the silversmith, but it could be S and R Hennel. Funnily enough, it, yeah. it, they're so badly. Uh, uh, the, uh, the assay mark is so badly rubbed, but it looks as though it could be SH, and then would it be RH underneath with S and R Hennel, who were also very fine silversmiths. Is that the same Hennel? That's the same Hennel who I believe today is still in business in Southampton Row. Right. Now, there's no one thing that neither... I mean, you, you've got it in your guess beautifully. It is a tip staff, but it is, as you said, a very rare one. And you haven't pointed out one thing about it, the bit at the end. Can you tell us what that is that comes out? Uh, no, I can't. It's very interesting, Roger, let me tell you, because um, apparently, don't put it back if you don't mind, because I, I'll show you how, this turned you from an ordinary tip staff into a water bailiff. This was the ore, and you could arrest people by just going, <laughs> sorry, I won't, won't uh, put it in because I'm taking too long, but by just putting that on, you could arrest them on the river as well. <laughs> don't you think it's rather nice? I think it's a super thing, that. So there you are, they've said it's very rare, it's obviously a collector's thing, and um, dispelling any doubt, I think, that it might have been, it was originally made just like that. So, uh, Humphrey, I think they're going to put a bit on that as a collector's thing, although, of course, it's 1814. Yes. It's only useful today, too, a sort of combined cosh and, uh, and pistol. Uh, 450 pounds. 450 pounds, I'm bid there by Humphrey Littleton, and uh, waggling the all around. What do you think, Joyce? Um... I think uh, 450 as Humphrey. I think 600 pounds. Well, you're nearer the mark. They put a thousand on it because it's so rare and obviously a thing that collectors would go for in a very big way. Five to nil then, Joyce leads. And what an interesting first piece that was. Yes. Five to nil. Let's see what happens with the second one. This English vase is an example of agate ware. The body is made of cream ware and is decorated with a marbled glaze. The base is made of black basalt and is impressed with the mark Wedgwood and Bentley. Date about 1775. Joyce Blair's first turn at this one. And mind the lid, yes. Yes, I will. In fact, it might be as well to take it out. Yes, the, the base is quite loose as well. Well, it is a small urn, and uh, it has this stopper in. I should think it was for, um, I don't know, they put dried leaves in and um, sort of scent thing or something. This is a pretty smell came out or something, although I don't see any holes for it to come out. I'm going to take the stopper off so that I can turn it upside down. There is a mark, and it's got... Ooh, it's Wedgwood and Bentley. So it is Wedgwood. The colour is um, brown and greens, for people who do not have colour television. Brown and green, sort of like the paint are sort of blended together. And it has... I think this is gold coming off on, on, on white, on these swags here. I think they're called swags. Um, I would think that is about... Um, Ooh, early 1700s, something like that. I really, I'm not quite sure about this. First quarter of the 18th century? Yes. Okay, Humphrey? 
death. <clears throat> I'm going to dice with death and, and lift it up. There's nothing much more I can say about it. I'm fascinated by the, by the glaze, which is in all these sort of swirly bits like that. I don't quite know how that was put on. It's a classical design, isn't it? I'd have put it in the second half of the 18th century, more than the first. Uh, but beyond that, there's nothing much more that I can say about it. All right, well, it says Wedgwood and Bentley. Point is, is it? And the date, second half, according to Humphrey, earlier, according to Joyce. Arthur. Well, Wedgwood and Bentley, I think it's the third half of the 18th century. Um, I'll just have a peep. Yes, that's nice. Um, curious, this vase, because there it is. Um, it's hardly what you call an agate ware, because of all these greens in it, but it's certainly a marbled sort of uh, vase, or clay, or whatever it is. Um, you ask how these were done. These are oxides of metal, just twiddled about and, and made, and then uh, that's the answer. But what interests me is this, this name, Wedgwood and Bentley. Now, Bentley, so I understand, was the man who first made this stuff at the bottom, that black stuff, <coughs> black basalt. And uh, this was a, a time when you, you've seen those black basalt cream jugs and all that, nothing to them at all but the shape dead black. So th this was the age when they began to shell, sell shapes to people. And look at that. I don't know the date of that, but I should think it must be around about Robert Adam. This must be around about 1770, something like that. But the mark in itself, Wedgwood and Bentley, I give the, the opposition a tip. If it's marked Wedgwood, it's worth so much money. If it's marked Wedgwood and Bentley, it's worth a lot more money. This would be one of a pair, or one of a garniture of three. Why more for Wedgwood and Bentley, Arthur? Because that's later than um, Wedgwood, isn't it? Yes, but um, there's so few bits that are marked Wedgwood and Bentley. There's masses of it marked Wedgwood, but so, uh, you know, he made these oval medallions. When they're marked Wedgwood and Bentley, they're so much nicer than when they're just Wedgwood. Well, that's an interesting tip. Roger. Uh, originally, all the white swagging has been gilt, a great deal of it is now missing, but Arthur, I think I'm right in saying that quite a lot of pottery of this date to find, uh, of good shape, uh, sometimes with raised decoration, was originally gilt, and the gilding has yeah. washed off, yes, and that has too. A, a, as it has to a very considerable extent. But I can still see gleams of it here. Presumably meant to represent Ormolu, isn't it? That, that, that is right. Mm -hmm. And well, you can, there again, you see the butt in, you can, you can nearly see Blue John vases with ormolu mounts. Here they are again, if you change the... It's almost a green John, oh. <laughs> isn't it? Yes, indeed. It, it, it is to... one vase, isn't it? Uh, no, it is one vase. Yes. And, uh, let us, anyway, make it a pair for fun. It is one vase. Make it a pair. And um, it's uh, 1775, so Arthur's third half <laughs> is just about right. The beginning of the last quarter. And the Wedgwood and Bentley period, 1768 to 80. So it's uh, the first go here of Joyce as a pair, Joyce. Therefore, worth more than double. Yes. Uh, well, I would think about in the region of 1,500 pounds. 1,500 pounds, Joyce bids. Now then, Humphrey, can you draw level? It's five she's up at the moment. Um, I'll go a shade higher than that and say 2,000. Should have been lower. It's 850. Because uh, this is, after all, um, not quite in the class of that tip staff that we saw. So it's five, uh, sorry, it's ten to five, in fact, uh, now that Joyce Blair leads. So Humphrey will have to get one on the nail next time to draw level if possible. But it's not next time now, it's time for Arthur's piece of furniture he brings us each week. Always a delightful piece, and I think you're going to find this equally so. As I'm sure you will if you like chairs, because this to the ordinary outline of this, a Hepplewhite armchair. Ordinary shield back armchair with nice pretty shapey arms on square taper legs and little spade feet. That's not the point about this chair. The point about this chair is the quality. If you could learn to recognize workmanship and quality just like this. Now look at those Prince of Wales plumes. Solid piece of wood, 
they're nearly like ostrich feathers. There they are, they think, and you can feel you can nearly blow them. Tied with a little tiny bit of ribbon tie. You remember that piece of wood has got to stay up and above everything else while they undercut all this and leave that little bit there just to do that. And look at these beads. All these splats were flat. That's being carved out. This bead's not being stuck on. Now watch my finger go down there. Never a tremor, never a waver. Just about a sixteenth to an eighth of an inch all the way, just so. Down to those lovely medallions just there. The shaped top rail. See, usually there's a flower head at the end. There's a little flower head there. But just look at that tiny little thing, stem, that comes out of there with those little leaves just to make it just that bit different. And you see, that sort of quality, that sort of carving, um, elevates this chair from the sort of thing that you find reproduced everywhere today, poor quality, modern reproductions. When you get one like this, it just shouts at you. And uh, recently one, something similar to this, one odd chair of that ilk, that quality, made 580 pounds in an auction. Thank you, Arthur, but I think Arthur gave you the warning. There are lots of reproductions, so don't think you've got one of those necessarily in your home. Now let's see you the score. Ten to nil in Joyce Bear's favour. What happens with the next object is? This 19th century French doll, known as a Parisian doll, is dressed in the clothes of a widow. The swivelling head and the shoulders are made of bisque porcelain. It was made by Jumeau of Paris about 1870. Humphrey has first go at this really out of turn in a sense, I think. Mm. <laughs> That's rather attractive. This is a, a doll on a stand. Pleasant, uh, pleasant face, but the less pleasant uh, extremities. The hand is a bit... Uh, the hand there is not quite so nicely made as the, as the face, which I think is in what, China. The, the hand is not in a different material. It looks to me to be slightly, to have the thumb on the wrong side, but still that may be uh, just an idiosyncrasy of the design. Um, Victorian, I would say, um, sort of mi middle of the, well, wait a minute, my royal dates are a bit off the spot, but I would say uh, sort of 1850-ish, that sort of time. And made whereabouts, do you think? Uh, oh, no, I don't know. Let's see if the lady knows. Joyce? Well, of course, it's Victoriana, without a doubt, isn't it? Um, she's got the, the back, I don't know whether you can see, it's all black. This is sort of like black silk and a little black velvet jacket, and she has a brown fur muff in her hand there, uh, with little black beads around her neck, and a dear little, oh look, a little gold cross around her neck, mm. little lace, and she's got sort of pink undies on, I think, and around the back it's quite sweet, I don't know whether you can see, she's got two dear little turquoise hat pins. Which match your ring, don't they? Yes, they do. But have a quick go yes, at the I date will. and where. The but... date, right. Um, I think this, the, I think it is sort of, could it be German? German and? And about, oh, um, 1830. 1830. I think yes. Humphrey thought 1880. Now then, what say you, Roger? I think one of the interests with dolls always is when you find them with the original clothing, uh, the way they show the exact style. Uh, th this, I would think, was a doll made about 1860 and is dressed in the costume of about 1875. If we had her away from the stand, she's just got the beginning of a bustle, bustle dress coming in. Uh, I question, uh, it, no, this is certainly not the original skirt, but about 1870. Made where? Uh, the uh, face, probably, uh, the head made in Germany. Could, she might be French, but it's very, possibly a German one. Thought to be by Jumeau, actually. A quick word from Arthur? Yes, Jumeau, Jumeau, Jumeau I, certainly. Mm. Nothing to add at all. Nothing at all. Right. Well, let's have a, 
that back. We may end a price on it because we want to get in another object if we can. And there we are then. Quick price uh, for you, uh, Humphrey. Uh, I would say uh, 100 pounds. 100 pounds? What say you, Joyce? Um, 125. And they say 85. So, in fact, Humphrey is the closer, gains his five, only just Humphrey there. It's ten to five. Now, the next one we'll have to do pretty quickly and take uh, straight to the experts. So, if you would, Mr. Green. One of a pair of English soft paste porcelain potpourri vases decorated with coloured enamels. They're marked on the base and were made at the Spode factory about 1825. You could take that straight to Mr. Neger, sir. Thank you. I think this is Spode. Um, don't, don't take this in the wrong way. For my word, this is such superb quality. If you haven't got a colour television set, go and get one. My God, this is beautiful, isn't it? You're right, Arthur. It is Spode. Spode, 1166. Now, it's a curious thing. That is a number which... Ooh. That is a number which people love. Um, I, I take it it's an artist number. My word, you only want to just have a look at the artist going to town with these coloured bouquets. Isn't it beautiful? And, and there they are, a pair. Beautiful. And it's a pair, so they're going to value it as a pair. Can I have that back then, Roger? And in fact, although a common pattern at 1166, Arthur said, very well known, not common to have them so large, in fact, rare. Now then, your go, Joyce, a pair. For the pair, oh, I'm going to, um, well, 3,000 pounds. 3,000 pounds. And yes. Humphrey. I'm going to come below that, say 2,000. You're right to go below, because it's 800, so it's a draw at 10 points all. <laughs> I'm delighted, then, to be able to present you with a prize each. I hope you won't quarrel about them. Some, I don't know who should... I think perhaps Humphrey should have the fish slice, should he? I don't know. Would, would you like to decide it between you? Give him that for the moment. And the other is a taper holder. It's absolutely beautiful. Fish you slice... Want it to be a draw. Yeah. Fish slice being 1829 oh. London. Oh, thank you very much. It's lovely. Oh. Ooh. So there we are, and it's uh, time for Arthur's competition, but let's see how the result first of last week. Arthur Negus valued the pewter charger at £80, and the first card taken at random from those agreeing with this price came from Mr. Neil H. Burden, Tricarol Manor, Trebullet, Lanson, Cornwall. Joyce says her, her present is lovely, my word says this. And couldn't have had a nicer chap to sit by the side of me while I talk about a Charles II brass candlestick, because he knows all about them. There it is, about 1670, absolutely untouched from about that age. What I like about it is the wide drip pan and also the great skirt base. Now, you get this on earlier things than this, on silver, on communion flagons, straight-sided, enormous skirt base. Look at a candlestick like that with a seven and a quarter inch diameter base. Look at the base of it, because that's the giveaway. This is what one likes to see, a base as nice as that. Then you can say, my word, that's nice. And so it is. Charles II candlestick, about 1670. How much would it bring in auction? Now write it on a postcard and send it to this program. Going for a song, BBC Bristol, BS8 2LR. Thank you, Arthur. Well, why don't you have a go on a postcard and join in Arthur's competition? Perhaps be the lucky person to win that £15 prize, but make it a, a brief candle. And isn't it a lovely, honest thing, that? 300 years old. Just a clue, though, brass has gone up a bit. It's not as cheap as it used to be. So, goodbye now, good hunting. to see Max Robertson again with the splendid Arthur Negus. And that was going for a song. And by the way, please don't enter the competition to value that candlestick. The competition was set in 1971, so your entries would arrive a little bit late. 
In an hour at a quarter past seven, John Goldsworthy's Foresight Saga stars Kenneth Moore, Eric Porter, Susan Hampshire and Nairi Dawn Porter with a strong supporting cast. That's in black and white, as is Jukebox Jury, which precedes it at 6.45 with host David Jacobs. Nina and Frederick, Jill Ireland and David McCallum form the panel. But in a moment or two, John Freeman is face to face with Adam Faith. Now this series, as I said earlier, represented a very welcome change in television interviewing technique. The subject was almost continually in close-up, and the viewer could clearly see all reactions as the conversation proceeded. Adam, who was born, Terry Nellums, was a four-pound-a-week messenger before the pop world discovered him and steered him to fame and fortune. In the conversation that follows, I think you'll agree with me, he comes across, as he is, a very likable and unassuming person. Here, then, is Face to Face. 